All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Press, and I'm the founder of Archers Raiders, a fan group designed to uni unite politically progressive fans, students, and alumni of the Morehouse Maroon Tigers and Colgate Raiders. This is the second installment of our interview and profile series called The Remarkable Student Athletes of Morehouse and Colgate. My guest today is Jeff Woodward, a junior psychology major at Colgate University. Uh, Jeff is a center for the Colgate Raiders men's basketball team. He was a key contributor on our last two teams, both of which won Patriot League titles and earned berths in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Excited to be here. All right. So um, I'd like to start by asking you about your journey to Colgate and um, your career so far. So when you were attending and playing for um, Thacton Senior High in Pennsylvania, uh, what was the recruitment process like for you and uh, which schools were you uh, considering? Uh, so the recruitment process, uh, a lot of it was through not just back then, but also through my AAU team, East Coast Power. Um, so obviously attended a lot of, uh, events, uh, like group, group live events, um, things like that. And then once I had been seen at events such as that, then the connections, uh, were really formed, you know, coaches coming to high school practices, high school open gyms, and then high school games as well during, uh, like actual season um and for the most part a lot of the schools that were recruiting me were patriot league schools a couple of ivs i was hearing from and then a couple of like, like scattered mid-major schools as well a lot of whom were in the philly area but it was primarily uh schools in the patriot league um and those were uh i had offers i had four offers in the end um they're all from patriot league schools Gotcha. Okay. And so at what point um, in your career did Colgate specifically express serious interest in you? Like what point did you begin to like expect um, an offer from them or did you realize that uh, they really wanted you to be a part of the program? Um, so it was during my, I was first noticed uh, in the summer before junior year and then um, like continued communication throughout most junior year. And then in the spring of my junior year, they had me up on an official visit. And that was, uh, for them, the, they typically run only official visits during uh, players' senior years. So that was kind of an indication of mm. uh, how much they wanted me. Um, like the, I don't want to say the length they were going to, to, to make sure I knew how much they wanted me. Um, and that, that was really when I was kind of like, this is a place that I'm seriously considering. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, so what ultimately sold you on Colgate um, over the uh, other schools in the Patriot League that um, that offered you scholarships? Um, a few things really did. Uh, the first thing being their great academic school. Um, obviously, at some point in my life, I'm going to stop playing basketball. And uh, having that education to fall back upon um, is really important to me. Uh, secondly, I mean, their basketball program, obviously, that's a, a big reason uh, that I was even afforded the opportunity to look at a school such as Colgate. Um, and, you know, while they hadn't had a historic tradition of winning outside of a couple times in the 90s, um, obviously, the program that Coach Langle had been building, uh, culminating in my junior year them winning um, a Patriot League championship it really showed the um, progression of the team and the, the ability of not just the players but the coaching staff to find and develop really good players and once they have the end of, once they have had those players in the program shown the ability to not just keep them there but to win with them um, so that was super important and then the final thing was it's Hamilton's a very small town uh, where Colgate's located. It's just about 3,000 people. The school of Colgate's just about 3,000 people as well. Um, and the sense of community there is absolutely incredible. Um, to this day, like, you, you'll be walking down the street. And somebody you might never have seen before, might never have met, don't know their name, uh, will come up to you and start talking to you and asking you about the team, how you guys are going to be this year, whether that could be a, a worker at uh, a local grocery store, um, the owner of a local business, or just a, a random resident. And to, to me, that's that's really cool. And to see the community involvement 
uh, and to get to experience that on a day-to-day basis, of how close the town and the school are, um, is really cool. And that was something that definitely drew me in. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And that's dope. I mean, uh, it sounds like it's a very, um, the Colgate community and then its connection with the city, very like close knit, very intimate. Um, and I experienced something similar actually at Morehouse. That's not a, a particularly big school. So everyone knows everybody. Everyone's kind of invested in their peers' success. So that's, uh, that's what it sounds like you, you got the sense of at Colgate as well. That's awesome. Um, so I think at this point, uh, you, you actually mentioned um, uh, Coach uh, Lengel. So uh, I think at this point, it's pretty uncontroversial to say that he's the greatest coach in Colgate basketball history. Um, what's it like to play for him? Um, it's really unique. He's very interesting to uh, love him death. Uh, he's the best coach I've ever had. No offense to high school coaches, A coaches, but I think they, they, they would probably agree. <laughs> um, and he is – He's not a, a traditional, you know, picture a traditional college coach on the sidelines yelling, uh, like really, I don't want to say like up in your face, but kind of more like that, in more in your face, more uh, dominant personality. Um, and Coach Langle is very much so the same as um He's just got this like quiet intensity about him. Like he'll he'll yell at you if you need to be yelled at, but he won't just yell to yell, and he won't just um ev- everything he does has a very specific purpose. So if he's yelling at you, he knows that that's the best way to coach you, and that's the best way to get through to you and make sure you know like you have to remember to do X, Y, or Z, or you have to stop doing X, Y, or Z. Um, and he's very methodical about everything he does but he's also extremely caring whenever you have a conversation with him the first question or the the first conversation you have isn't about whatever he wants to talk about he's Mm. asking how you're doing he's asking how school's going he's asking how your family is and uh, he's never satisfied with one word answers he's never satisfied with you know short explanations he wants you know you to go in depth and actually explain you know how are all your classes going? What are you learning? Why is that interesting to you? Uh, how is your family? How are your parents? Everything like that. He really wants to know because he really does care. Um, so he, he's very much like the same on and off the court. And I love that about him that, you know, what you see is what you get with him. And he's very upfront, very honest with everybody on the team. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I mean, just that uh, a couple of points that you brought up that really stood out to me, like that you, um, that he kind of caters his coaching style to what each player specifically needs. And then that um, he seems like genuinely invested in each of you, not just as basketball players, but as people taking a proactive interest in you guys' lives. That's, um, that's awesome. So that's, uh, that's great to hear. Um, so as you move into your uh, junior year at Colgate, um, what, what would you say is the most memorable experience you've had so far during your um, college career? Um. I think it's a, a, a tie. Uh, it's kind of a four-way tie, I guess. But um, both, actually, no, I, I think I'm not. Probably the highlight of my first two years has been winning the Pitcher League title this past year just because of the experience of getting to do it, not just on our home court, but in front of fans, which we didn't have the opportunity to the year before. Um, obviously, that first one was very special. It's first time in college winning anything um significant so that was that was incredible and i loved that team uh and that group of guys but to get a celebrate with not just the student population but um the community um the other members of the athletics department um that celebration that the, the excitement in that gym that night was was really really cool and then obviously the two march madnesses have been pretty cool as well um, but I think really the, the memory that really sticks out is that moment, you know, the, the crowd rushing the court after we won and everything and that it was, it was really cool. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine so. I'd imagine so. And, and I mean, those, um, I think you'd made this point earlier about, um, 
you know, Colgate not having a, a, a long history of, um, of success um, in basketball. And so, yeah, like the league, the, the league titles that, um, that, um, that the team won with you are one of not a ton of league titles that have been won in, in, um, in the school's history. So it's really like you guys really are, um, have like played a significant, you've really played a significant role in like Colgate basketball history. So that's, um, that's awesome. All right. So um, let's see here. Now I want to shift gears a bit. Um, many people uh, wrongly believe that athletes are a one dimensional, um, lacking the ability to speak on important political issues facing our country today. Um, of course, this couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the reality is that uh, professional and collegiate athletes are often intimately connected to their communities and have a deep understanding of the challenges facing them. Um, I think this is really especially true of um, of, uh, of Morehouse men and, um, and Colgate graduates as well. Uh, so that being said, my first question is actually about specifically um, the political climate that you've experienced at Colgate. Um, as a student, do you get the sense that there are any politically uh, political issues, excuse me, that are particularly animating for um, your peers? Um, as far as specific issues, I wouldn't say there's anything that like is specifically highlighted. Um, but Colgate is, you know, it's a small liberal arts school. The town of Hamilton is a is a quite liberal town as well, and so politics are very much so on the forefront of a lot of things we do. Um, we're also uh, a cool part about Colgate is that we are the the land that Colgate's on, the land that is around Colgate is part of Oneida land, the former Native American land. So there's many signs around campus. There's many things like that that also highlight you know that uh, area of our history. But overall, it's a very politically active community. Um, everybody cares has issues that they care about. Everybody has um, issues that they're specifically uh, either protesting for or against. And you see that represented all around campus, whether that's um, groups meeting up to discuss issues, or that, you know, you might just see banners or flyers. There's been some marches organized. Um, and so there's not one specific issue that I think really is, is highlighted, but it's just the fact that all, all Colgate, not just student athletes, but also um, just students in general are very willing and able and ready to speak what they they believe and speak what they know and believe to be true yeah yeah that makes sense it seems that uh that seems like a great like a great uh, atmosphere and community to be a part of um i definitely had a similar experience at um at morehouse i think at many colleges you know there's like a certain um and this is not i do not say this in an insulting way um i don't want to put any other schools down but uh you know a lot of college students given their age can be um you're quite silly, you know, they're not particularly politically engaged or politically active, uh, which is perfectly fine. Um, but um, I think uh, it's awesome that you feel like your peers, not just athletes, but students as well, um, have the ability and have the desire to speak on different issues that they care about. So that's, um, that's really cool. Um, so next, I, I want to ask you about um, uh, some politics more specific to Pennsylvania, where you're, you're from. Uh, so one of the more high profile Senate races is currently going on in Pennsylvania. Um, are you uh, are you following the uh, race between progressive Democrat John Fetterman and um, Dr. Oz? Uh, I am. It's a little hard not to in PA at the current moment. I, I'm not in PA at the current moment, but uh, still seeing a lot of stuff on uh, my social media and things like that. Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting race. Obviously, Dr. Oz, famous PD personality. Uh, some questions as to whether he lives in Pennsylvania right. or not. <laughs> um, and I, John Fetterman, I think he's, he's very interesting as well. Um, I first learned about him through a clip on John Oliver's show late, uh, last night. Last week tonight, you can't speak. Last week tonight, um, learning about him just because he doesn't look like a typical politician, six 
seven, six, eight ish, bald head, beard, kind of like doesn't doesn't look like a traditional politician. Um, so I think it's a very interesting Senate race. I think it's uh, not just important because uh, Pennsylvania is a very key swing state, and there's things uh, you look at voting trends of who gets selected in the Senate that typically will indicate you know which way the state might swing um, during uh, political election or during presidential elections. So I think it's interesting in that regard. Um, but also it's kind of, I'd say, two, two outsiders, two people who you know, might not be traditionally pegged as politicians kind of going at it. And I think that's important. I think it's cool. So while both have their strengths and both have their weaknesses, I think it's really important that, you know, more people get involved in politics, maybe people who might not seem like they should be or are in politics should get into politics. Yeah, yeah, that's real. I, I think uh, it's, you've actually got a similar dynamic going on right now in the state of Georgia, um, where Morehouse is located with um, uh, Morehouse man, actually, Raphael Warnock, current senator in Georgia, running against Herschel Walker, um, you know, former Heisman Trophy winner. And that is a... Uh, it at this point, I'll say it's kind of funny. It may not be funny if Herschel Walker actually wins. I'm not sure how much you've seen Herschel talk, but um, yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting dynamic. Something similar though, right? Where Raphael Warnock is a, a reverend, does not have a long history in um, in politics. Herschel Walker certainly doesn't either. So you've got these two outsiders kind of uh, running for. Um, yeah, very important political office in what's become a, a swing state. So it's a, I think it's a similar dynamic there. Um, be interesting to see how these, uh, how both these races ultimately play out. Um, all right, so let's move on here. Uh, I want to ask now about a, a few issues um, being discussed and debated in uh, our national political discourse. Um, first, I want to talk about um, the issue of... Um, uh, police brutality, police corruption, and police reform. Um, at this point, it's been a couple years since uh, George Floyd's murder at the hands of the Minneapolis police. Um, during the protests following his death, there was much talk about police reform. Uh, some people even called for defunding the police. Um, in the last two years, do you think enough has been done to fix uh, the police brutality and corruption that um, poor people often endure in impoverished districts across the country? Um, so when, after the, the, the George Floyd murder happened and after, um, you know, all the fallout that occurred from there, um, a, a really cool thing I think happened up at Colgate and especially with the men's basketball team, um, where Coach Langle kind of, I don't want to say forced us into it, but kind of, you know, made us have those difficult conversations about, um, what was going on and what was happening and obviously our our team is you know there, there's a mix of african-american uh, young men you know white young men there's there's a half a decent mix and so it was it was really cool and it was really eye-opening to see not just the different perspectives but the different viewpoints even from within those different perspectives um, for example, uh, Nellie Cummings was and still is very um, active in the community, making sure and supporting a lot of different causes and getting the message out and doing all the things that he can. And uh, a guy like Jordan Burns, who cares about the same issues, he cares about what's going on. He wants there to be reform. He wants, you know, People to stop dying at the hands of police, but he was he took more of a viewpoint of I don't know enough and I don't have I, I don't feel almost comfortable in, in in expressing these viewpoints. And it was it was very interesting to hear how two people who held the same beliefs expressed them differently. And that's not to say one is right and one is wrong, um, but it's just interesting to see. So. We learned a lot about that, and those conversations have continued from freshman year and into sophomore year as well. And we continue to have those difficult conversations, which I think is really cool. Um, 
about our team because we feel comfortable enough. Um, so we, I, I personally learned a lot um, in the past two years uh, about situations that I had no idea about. And so overall, I'd say I don't know if enough has been done. I can't. I mean, there are specific examples like if you look at the city of uh, I want to say it's Camden in Delaware, where um, after some instances of police brutality, they fired the entire police force. They rehired a brand new one. I want to say it's Camden. That's right. Um, yep. Rehired a brand new one and uh, reports of police brutality of uh, all the, the things we want to see eliminated have kind of dropped way down. And so obviously you look at that and it's, it, it, that, that seems to be a really strong indication of what can happen with some theory, real serious reform. But obviously that's not a realistic um, possibility in some bigger cities. Like you can't just fire the entire NYPD and then right. expect to retrain mm-hmm. a whole new one overnight. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's important. One of the biggest things that I think is important is that these conversations keep happening because it can't just be when something happens, then we have a conversation. Um, there's some, there's posts on social media about it. Everyone, everyone obviously wants it to be changed, but then no real change ever occurs. So I think keeping the conversation going, which is difficult. Um, people's attention spans aren't that long. People, with the 24-hour news cycle, are always getting new information, always getting new news. Um, so I think it's important to keep the conversation going if you want there to be lasting change, and I think there does need to be lasting change. Gotcha. Yep. I think that's um, yeah, it's really unique that um, Coach Langle uh, proactively engaged you all in like conversation about this. You know, I remember seeing. Um, like in the wake of George Floyd's murder, uh, specifically some of the like high profile D1 football coaches, it seemed that they kind of issued public statements like in front of the, like ahead of the team without consulting the team. And um, that did not, in, in many cases, that didn't really go over so well with the team. So I think it's really uh, cool that um, that Coach Langle um, like proactively engaged you all in the discussion about uh, these important issues. So that's awesome. Um- Another thing he actually did um, along the same lines, um, and this was also in connection with other student athletes, not just with the team, but also um, the whole university. Obviously, a, a close association with police brutality, police violence, things like that, is kneeling for the national anthem. And so Coach Langle obviously wanted uh, the players on the team to feel comfortable expressing whatever they wanted um, in their response to this. So my freshman year, I definitely, and I don't know about this year, but definitely my freshman year, uh, I think about half the team was kneeling during the National Anthem. And we, there's there a couple of us who consulted and wrote up a, a short little article, not even an article, kind of just like a blurb that would be read out um, at the beginning of our games before the National Anthem was played, um, expressing how, while we might not all be doing the same thing during the national anthem. We all are supporting each other. We all are um, kind of, I don't want to say like, obviously respecting, but kind of we're being together, even if we're not all doing um, the exact same thing. And obviously that was kind of really highlighted when we played teams like the services, service academies. Obviously, we know the sacrifices that they go through and we know all that they do. And we didn't want to, we didn't want anyone to feel like we were being disrespectful. We obviously didn't want to feel like we were trying to offend or intentionally off-put anyone. But we wanted to make sure that everyone knew that this was team decisions that were made. That this wasn't individuals. These were, these were individual decisions with kind of the, the team supporting every single individual decision, no matter what it was. Gotcha. Okay, I can dig it. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to our next question here. Um, so recently, as I'm sure you're aware, the Supreme Court overturned uh, Roe v. Wade, allowing states to make their own abortion laws with no oversight from the federal government. Um, some Republican majority states have already moved to outlaw abortion completely. Um, what are your thoughts on this, A? And um, B, is there anything you'd like to see elected officials do in response to it? Um, I mean, 
my, my thoughts on it is that I really don't think that the, the government should be deciding who has what type of health care when they have that and when they have that type of health care. I think that that is a extremely personal decision and I think it's a case by case basis. Um, and but no matter what, it should be a personal decision. And I don't think that there should be um, requirements either way. Uh, because that's taking away uh, a person's just ability to choose and their ability to decide and make decisions for themselves, which I feel is um, very important in not just aspects of healthcare, but in all aspects of life. Um, a person's ability to decide their own life slash fate, uh, what they want to do. And if somebody doesn't agree with that, kind of too bad to that other person it's not their life um so i think it's really important that people should have their own decisions or should have the ability to make their own decisions about it no matter what their decisions are um and then as far as elected officials go um i think that they should listen to what the majority of people say i don't think it should be uh, a, a group of a couple people deciding, or even let's say in a, in a state government, a couple hundred people deciding what the thousands, millions of people in their states cannot, can or cannot do. Um, I really don't think that should be up to the people. And I think that our laws should reflect that. And I think our elected officials should respect that, that it should be the people's choice and not their own personal beliefs or the beliefs of those who help get them elected yeah yeah i um i think that makes sense uh and i think it's interesting that you see uh there was a rec recent um uh ballot initiative in uh, kansas that caused quite a bit of consternation amongst uh, uh conservative media when even though kansas you know is a red state um their residents uh voted um basically to protect abortion rights within the state so yeah i i, I agree um as as much as possible, it should, the, the people's say should um, should ultimately decide what happens. Um, all right, just moving on here. Uh, so since the uh, pandemic, uh, there's been a rise in um, gun violence in America, uh, also violent crime. Um, the homicide rate in many cities has increased, and our country has dealt with several high-profile mass shootings in public spaces. Um, what do you think should be done to uh, to deal with this um, deal with this issue? Um, obviously, I think it's it's a very complicated issue. I don't think that there's there's one easy solution, and that factors into not just the mentality of uh, several different parts of the American populace, but also the way that laws are written, not just at the federal level, but also at the state level, and the way that those laws have been interpreted by um, the Supreme Court and other courts throughout America. Um, I think a big thing is that there needs to be a lot more accountability and the ability to hold people accountable. Uh, I think that you, there there needs to be ways to, I know it sounds kind of simple and I just said that there weren't simple solutions, but stop people who shouldn't be having guns from having guns, um, whether that's through red flag laws or that's through um, banning, not Certain pop, like certain populists, i.e., those convicted of felonies or those convicted of um, violent crimes, that they should be more. There should be more regulation, more stricter regulation as far as that go. Um, things like a, a national gun database, so we know who has guns where. Um, and obviously, I don't think it would solve problems overnight. Um, I think a, a large part of especially mass shootings, also plays into uh, the mental health crisis in America. Um, I think a lot of issues stem from poor mental health, um, people dealing with undiagnosed mental illnesses. I think as far as the back to the gun issue, I think there's, there's a lot of layers. And those people who suggest simple solutions on either side of the aisle kind of are, I'd say, pretty delusional to think that one simple law or one series of laws could stop this. Obviously, it needs to be stopped. Um, 
we can't keep offering thoughts and prayers to families of school children. Um, but I think it's something that both sides of the aisle kind of have to concede uh, from viewpoints. So whether that's, you know, uh, the viewpoint of the NRA where no gun should be taken ever in any circumstance, or the, the, the view of some people on the left who are saying there shouldn't be any guns in America. Um, I think both sides need to come together and compromise a little bit because it is, it isn't just a one side of the aisle issue. Um, it's kids being killed. It's young adults. It's adults. It's the elderly being killed. And it doesn't matter what state it's in. It doesn't matter what populace is being shot at. Like it's, it's a serious issue. It's an American issue. It's not any other type of issue. Yeah, I think that's very well said. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's uh, definitely much more nuanced than um, many give it credit for. Um, and I think a couple of the solutions that you uh, provided, uh, put forth, uh, could be very effective. The need for a national gun database, and even just giving like the ATF the ability to more effectively like track guns. So to require probably more funding for the ATF. Um, I think, um, yeah, I very well said. Um, all right. Uh, so the last question I want to ask here is actually about the um, prospect of college athletes unionizing. So recently, the College Football Players Association was founded in an attempt to secure long-term medical care, a percentage of media revenue, and a host of other benefits for players. Do you think it's a good idea for college athletes to, um, to unionize? Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, I think that the, the impact, especially if you're looking at some more high-contact sports like football, um, ice hockey, which is obviously a huge sport up at Colgate, and other sports like that, even sports like lacrosse, and all sports, not just those more high-impact ones. Um, you know, the, the, the lasting damage to your health, the lasting impacts to your health, it doesn't stop after you graduate, it doesn't stop after you stop playing, um, and I think that there should be some accountability and there should be some there should be some form of compensation for everything that student athletes do for their universities for organizations like the NCAA um, because we bring in so much money for the NCAA or for our, our colleges for our universities for our leagues you know if there were no college sports there is no NCAA uh, NCAA. So if you kind of think about it in that way, you have a bunch of people who are providing a bunch of jobs for people at the, the university level, at the league level, at the interleague level that wouldn't exist if those college athletes didn't exist. And I think that people have made careers off the backs of student athletes who their careers after, ended after their senior year. And so I think it's important that student athletes not just get the recognition. Obviously, you look at you know, the higher, the highest level of you know, football players, basketball players, they're going to be going to their respective professional leagues. Any player who's good enough to play professionally will probably end up playing professionally. But there's also that certain percentage of people who don't have that opportunity or don't choose to pursue that opportunity for a wide variety of reasons. And I don't think it's fair to them to say, well, hey, you know, you got your school paid for uh, if you want a scholarship or you got part of your school paid for or you had the opportunity to play a college sport. And that should be a reward enough um, because you look at a, a normal store, uh, college student schedule and you look at a athlete schedule and they're they're pretty different. Uh, it's a lot of time commitment. It's a commitment of your body, of your mind, of your health. It's a commitment of everything about you. So I think that there should be some form of, even if it's not direct compensation, even if it's not paying um, college athletes, I think, especially for those at risk of uh, high risk of you know head injuries who are probably going to be dealing with those effects, years later down the line, they should 
probably be covered in some way, shape, or form by the colleges that they brought in thousands of dollars for, if not more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, you make a great point there about the difference and what's expected of a um, a student who's going to college strictly for academics and a student athlete who's expected to uh, maintain a specific academic standard while also competing at a very high level. Um, and even the value that each of those students bring to the school financially is very different. I mean, I was fortunate to get a full academic scholarship to Morehouse, but my value to Morehouse is significantly, objectively, it's significantly less than like your value to Colgate. And so the idea that like, well, we can give these two students are getting like the same things. Well, you know, in a, in a society in which people are supposed to be compensated um, based on the value that they bring to a specific organization, it does make sense that there would be something additional for um, the athletes, as you uh, as you suggested. Um, as a follow up, there, do you um, you know, there's been a uh, a pretty strong unionization push across all walks of life in America recently. A lot of um, Starbucks workers across the country have been unionizing. Um, are you, do you generally think that unions are a good way to uh, sort of push back on, or balance out corporate power? I, I definitely think so. I think uh, one individual worker is pretty easily replaced. But if you have a collection of all the workers in a certain business, that's not so easily replaced. Um, and obviously, to go along with things like being able to leverage their position to negotiate for better pay or for better working conditions, which obviously I think everyone can get behind. Um, they, they also can provide health care for the, their workers, which obviously is another big hot button issue in this, uh, in America. So if you have the ability for, I, I would say, kind of private unions to provide health care for people, why wouldn't we you know, take that opportunity to try and alleviate some stress on whether that be insurance companies or, or, or government um Healthcare, so I think it, it's important because they they contribute a lot and they help they they help level the playing field in the sense that it's not just one person going against the corporation, um, it's the, the the whole corporation almost going against itself or all the all the the, the, the foundation of that corporation um, going against the corporation itself instead. So I I do think it's important. You well well said. All right. Um, I think that's my, uh, that'll be my last question. Um, Jeff, thank you so much uh, for being so generous with your time. I really did enjoy talking to you and um, yeah, good luck um, going into your uh, junior year as a student and as a uh, basketball player. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.